Let's welcome him with a round of applause. Thank you very much, Mami, for such a good opening. I believe you've set us on a good course. And we are actually also very uh, fortunate to have a resource person who is very much suited to the topic that we are going to discuss this evening. And not only suited, he's not an external person, he's also an engineer like us. And I was telling my people that one of prominent engineering educators who have trained many engineers through the years. So just to introduce him briefly, engineer Dr. George Afriki is a mechanical engineer trained at the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, KNUST, and the University of Paris in France, with humble beginnings from Panto Technical Institute and Accra Polytechnic. He obtained his doctorate degree, degree in fluid mechanics from France in 1903. Having graduated earlier from KNUST with a diploma in mechanical engineering in 1973 and a BSc mechanical engineering degree in 1978. Engineer Dr. Petty is a technical and vocational education and training seabed expert and engineering educator with over 30 years of experience as a university teacher and seabed consultant to the World Bank. UNESCO, African Union Commission, and African Development Bank, amongst others. He has taught at University of Syria and France. He was principal of Co Polytechnic, now Co Technical University, for 13 years and served for four years as Secretary General of the Commonwealth Association of Technical Universities and Polytechnics in Africa, which is based in. Union Chief Expert for four years. Dr. Afeti is currently a senior skills development advisor on the Skills Initiative for Africa program, which is funded by the Kremlin government and implemented by the African Union Development Agency, AUDA NEPA, in eight countries, including Ghana, under the auspices of the African Union Commission. He is also the current he is also currently vice chair of the consultative advisory group of the Partnership for Science Engineering. Based in Africa has just been released. So this is uh, our speaker for tonight, and uh, I believe it's Tal. Have quite an informal approach. I'm sure he's going to share some ideas with us. We will not have a presentation in particular, but he's going to uh, share some ideas and based upon that, we can also interact with him. With our online audience, let's just pay attention to what our distinguished speaker has for us tonight. Please, let's give him an applause. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Engineer. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, those who are here and those who are virtually uh, watching us. Um, I want this interaction to be a conversation, actually, uh, because TVET is a subject that uh, demands an approach different from a typical uh, lecture for engineers. <laughs> this is going to be a, a sort of conversation. My intention is that I'm going to benefit from your inputs as well as we proceed to make Tibet what it should be in Ghana and uh, Africa. So let me start. Uh, I'll take just about 20 minutes or so to speak, and then I think we can have more time to uh, interact, especially with the online uh, audience.
past education policy misconceptions and uh, misalignments, colonial era notions of the role of education in society, and uh, persistent social prejudices account for this misunderstanding and limited appreciation of the importance of TV in national development. Although in recent years, technical professional skills development has gradually climbed towards the top of the education and training policy agenda as an effective strategy to curb the growing challenge of youth unemployment, a brief review of the past will uh, provide a useful review mirror for understanding the present and how to build the future of TVET in the country. Current policies and practices, though helpful, are yet to achieve the impact that is required to transform and uh, revitalize the TVET subsector for rapid socioeconomic development. But first, what are the lessons of history and how have the experiences of the past shaped our understanding and appreciation of TVET today? Ladies and gentlemen, historically, uh, formal education in colonial Gold Coast began with reading and writing, and not the learning of practical and vocational skills. Professor Ivan Adimens, a former vice chancellor of the University of Ghana, had this to say while delivering a public lecture at the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences in uh, 2000. This is what he said. He said that the curriculum of the schools started by the missionaries during the early colonial period was limited, and I quote, was limited to reading and writing of a European language and the performance of simple arithmetical exercises so that an educated person could act as an interpreter or medium for the advancement or perpetuation of the societal norms and values. Clearly, the acquisition of technical and vocational skills was not a priority for the early school system. An educated person who was respected by society was the one who could write and speak the white man's language and interact with the Europeans. The focus of the early missionary and colonial schools was therefore to build local manpower, and note that I'm saying manpower because it's only men who are involved, actually. <laughs> manpower to respond to the needs of the evangelizing churches and the colonial administration, as well as the desire of the natives, or in quotes, for Western style education with little or no room for science and uh, technology education. The technical skills associated with practical occupations, such as the construction of dwellings, farming and uh, fishing, were not considered important enough to be incorporated into the early school curriculum. For a long time, the acquisition of uh, manual occupational skills was confined to the traditional apprenticeship system, where master trainers passed on their skills 
in an informal manner uh, to their uh, apprentices. The stage was therefore set for literacy and numeracy education to be ranked over and above technical and for the training of young people who were considered insufficiently prepared academically for grammar school education. Admittedly, certain schools like Achimota and Infantive taught subjects such as carpentry and arts and crafts, but the teaching was not occupational oriented. And in any case, not as important as Greek, Greek and Latin. The early development of secondary education in the country was therefore geared towards the training of scholars in, in the courts and not skilled artisans and technicians. The purpose of this uh, presentation is to assess the challenges and opportunities for growth and uh, revitalization of the TVS system in the country. In order to better appreciate the challenges and policy options for positive change, it is important to understand the current dynamics of the TVET sector. TVET delivery systems in Ghana may be classified as five of the three borough categories. The formal TVET system, which is institution-based, time-bound, and with a standardized curriculum and learning objectives, examination driven and certification as an introduction that is nationally uh, recognized. And then we have the non formal TVET, which refers to skills acquisition outside the school system, which has clear learning objectives with specified training duration, but is not nationally certified such as uh, short duration skills training offered by NGOs and similar organizations for targeted populations, as well as enterprise based on the job training. And then finally, we have the informal training system, which encompasses a wide range of flexible, non-standardized skills acquisition programs that take place in the informal sector of the economy. The most widespread and typical example of informal TV is traditional apprenticeships. The Commission for TV or CTV is by law the agency with overall responsibility for the coordination of all levels of TV delivery in the country. This includes the formal, non formal, and the informal, as well as skills development at the pre tertiary at tertiary levels. The mandate of CTVET is very broad, and this ambitious mandate is often cited as a weakness. For example, potential policy conflicts pertaining to the overall supervisory authority of the service over technical schools 
and the autonomy of the technical universities as tertiary level TVET institutions relative to the mandate of CTV remains unresolved in practice. The capacity of CTV to coordinate TVET activities across several ministries has also been called into question. Since CTV is an agency of the Ministry of Education, but you all know that there are many TVET institutions under different ministries, agriculture, health, and so on. However, the need for a central TVET coordinating body is necessary and critical for the development of a holistic, integrated, flexible, and efficient national TV system. TV system in the country is still very much fragmented with the participation of many public and private sector entities. In spite of efforts to bring all TV providers under the Ministry of Education, the quality of TV training offered by some private and sometimes even public providers is poor. And the certificates awarded by some of the providers are of doubtful value. The proliferation of such certificates, which do not correspond to the actual skills competence of the trainees, continues to cast a slur on technical and vocational education and contributes to further dent the image of TVET. It is in this light that the important role and mandate of CTVET as a regulatory and accreditation body for TVET should be viewed. Now, if we look at the social demand for TVET in Ghana today, uh, we know that it's very low, social demand. And there are reasons for it. First of all, TVET is not the first choice of young people and their parents for post-basic school education and training. And quite often, it is we, the highly placed in society, who will not want our children or wards to go to TV schools. It's, it's something that has to change, but there's need for doing something for this to change. The low social demand for TVET stems from the poor public perception and the wrong notion that TVET is for the less endowed academically. Although this unfortunate perception is gradually changing, the marginalization of TVET is reflected in several forms within the national education and training system. Firstly, there are many more senior high schools than technical institutes at the second cycle of education level. The social demand for TVET is therefore constrained by the low absorption capacity of TVET institutions. Due to the inadequate academic and physical infrastructure of many of the existing schools, only a small percentage of about five to seven percent of junior high school graduates can be admitted into public and private schools. Secondly, the majority of junior high school graduates prefer senior high school education to technical and vocational education. For example, the computerized school selection and placement system, uh, CSSPS data for 2014, for example, show that out of about 425,000 DEC candidates, only 16,000 opted for technical and vocational education. Career guidance and orientation of primary and junior secondary school students, as well as public and media education, can help minimize the poor perception of TV. It is also expected that the conversion of the polytechnics into technical universities will remove, remove the notion that the TVET track is a dead end, since TVET graduates will now have the opportunity of a logical tertiary education progression pathway to develop their skills to the highest level possible. 
In contrast to the low social demands for TV education in Ghana, in many of the high-performing economies of the world, a sizable proportion of their youth are enrolled in TV programs. The proportion of young people under 25 years who are enrolled in TV is 77% in Austria, 70% in Finland, 51.5% in Germany, 50% in Korea, 44.6% in Spain, 8.7% in Brazil, compared with less than 5% in Ghana. Although there is no empirical evidence to directly link enrollments in TV to economic prosperity, these enrollment figures are nevertheless instructive. However, there appears to be a timid uptake in the absolute numbers of students graduating from technical schools from 17,000 final year students in 2019 to 24,000 in 2021. But this these numbers are still very small compared with uh, the graduation rates from senior high schools. The low social demand for TVET education is also a consequence of the equally low market demand for both basic and high level technical and vocational skills. Of course, there's a deficit of skilled labor in some sectors of the economy, such as building and construction, for competent masons, tilers, and plumbers. At the high end of the spectrum, there's a deficit of competent technicians and technologies to support engineers in operating and maintaining complex production and manufacturing systems. The economic demand for TVET is a function of labor market conditions. The structure of the economy is therefore a key determinant. If the economy is based on importation and trade, which may be described as a buy and sell economy, the demand for TV skills will be low. Because of the current dominant business culture of import and sell, the manufacturing sector in Ghana today is not a great buyer of skills. The major preoccupation, preoccupation for the sector being nuisance taxes and access to reasonably cheap credit facilities. The employment opportunities for TV graduates are therefore limited. A situation which again constitutes a disincentive for young people to choose TV education. Training quality is another challenge of the TV system. It is changed by several factors, key among investment and involvement in TV. Industry is often reluctant to provide learning internships to students, principally because of the absence of structures or incentives for them to do so, or simply because many firms are themselves weak financially and are struggling. So they may not have any great inclination to invest in TV education. Number two. Inadequate teacher quality. In TV education, it is not enough for teachers to possess only technical qualifications and pedagogical skills. There is a need for an adequate number of TV instructors who are both teachers and practitioners. That is, TV teachers who possess not only academic and uh, pedagogical qualifications but also relevant and workplace experience. Unfortunately, such persons are also highly in demand and sought after by industry. Three, outdated curricula. TV curricula are in many cases outdated and unresponsive to the needs 
of modern businesses and the changing world of work, which is driven by digital technologies. Four, obsolete training and academic facilities. Many TVET institutions lack the modern equipment and academic facilities necessary for effective skills training. The situation is worsened by the absence of education and training partnerships and collaboration with the industry. Since such partnerships would enable students and the staff to be practically trained on industry standard facilities at little cost to the training institutions. Five, low STEM education at the basic education level. The poor preparation of students in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics subjects at the basic education level is a major inhibitor of scientific and technical skill development at the post junior high school and higher levels. Six, weak assessment of TVS skills. Until recently, the assessment of TVS students has been theory dominated with minimal evaluation of their practical skills. It is expected that the introduction of the competency-based training, CBT methodology in TVET education will help improve the quality and job readiness of TVET graduates. As you all know, CBT emphasizes the acquisition of practical skills competences and attitudes for the world of work. And lastly, seven, poor information and statistics on the TV. There's not enough data behind the academic research on the TV system in the country. For example, how much does it cost to train students in the various disciplines? Because this information is necessary in order for adequate funds to be budgeted for training of the various uh, uh, disciplines uh, in, the, in the technical institutions, but we don't know. So government normally allocates just a lump sum based on student. The employment rates, starting salaries, and job prospects for graduates of the different courses and programs of study. This will be necessary for the education of the public and parents and the young people if they know that with a TVET qualification, you will add quite something to be proud of. That information is not uh, available. Now, ladies and gentlemen, have you identified the key challenges of the TVET delivery system? The good news is that the TVET narrative is changing. And the country is currently implementing policies and strategies to address these challenges and revitalize TV. These recent initiatives include the establishment of CTVET, TVET as a supervisor and regulator of TVET in the country, and also the creation of a dedicated TVET service responsible for pre tertiary TVET delivery outside the Ghana Education Service. Most of you may know that now technical schools are no longer under the GEAs. They also they have their own self-teammate uh, service. But these are sometimes very cosmetic things. We'll come to it shortly. Another good thing that we have also observed is that industry-led sector skills bodies in some sectors have also been established to provide information and support to training providers on the skills needs, gaps, and shortages in the various economic sectors of the country. This will offer opportunities for market relevant and uh, employment-oriented skills training to be delivered to TVET students. Funding for TVET infrastructure development has also received a major boost in recent years. According to CTVET, government has made an investment of one billion US dollars in TVET institutions over the past four years for the expansion of infrastructure 
and provision of modern training equipment for the technical universities, creation of skills development centers, and training of instructors. So on paper, we see that a few positive things are happening. The question is whether we will be seeing results or whether we are just putting emphasis on inputs and not on the outputs or even the throughputs of the system. However, if these resources are properly deployed to support the development of practice-oriented TV, opportunities for young people to acquire relevant employable skills to enter the job market and contribute to national social economic development will be greatly enhanced. So what kind of skills does Ghana need? A critical analysis of the labor market shows that the country needs competent, locally trained masons. We need more masons. Uh, we need more plumbers. We need more talents. We need more electricians. Those of you who are trying to do some tally at home will know that, but quite often you may have to perhaps uh, have to do with uh, people from Togo uh, who do all, most of the tally and then the POP and so on. So we need to have more locally trained artisans in these categories. We also need to have a highly skilled workforce capable of driving economic transformation through value addition to primary communities and natural resources and generally supporting the manufacturing sector to drive industrialization. It is often said that natural resources do not have natural owners. It is those who can exploit the resources who are the owners. That is why our oil and gas is being exploited, and then uh, we are not getting the full benefits uh, from it because <laughs> we, 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 we have the natural resources, but we are not the natural owners. Those who exploit these resources are the natural owners, and then they give us peanuts. So that is also one area where we need to perhaps uh, pay much more attention on the training of a skilled labor force. TV graduates can also contribute to the building of a green economy by, for example, learning to install and maintain uh, solar mini grid uh, systems and management of e waste and environmental pollution. You can get TV graduates, you can do this better than those who are in abomination and are involved in e waste uh, recycling. Opportunities for young people in TV therefore abound. That is why the overused narrative that TV is not for the academically poor learner. That is what everybody has been saying, but we need to change that narrative. We need to change it to TVET is a prime mover for industrialization, economic growth, and sustainable livelihoods. The advocacy for TVET must change from a negative undertone to a positive perspective. We should not continue to be saying that uh, TVET is not for the academically less endowed. That is an old self-defeatist narrative which must change. We should not talk positively about it, what it can do for the country, for young people as well. That is what will drive them into the TV sector. Creating opportunities and a positive outcome for TV will require a systems approach to engineering education as a whole. There's a need for stakeholders in the skills development skill development ecosystem to understand the principles, relationships, and interdependencies in the continuum of skills. That is why the Ghana Institution of Engineering must be commended for bringing together artisans, technicians, technologists, and engineers into the same field, because we are looking at the continuum of skills and the interdependencies can be profitable and helpful to the economy of the country. 
this would greatly promote systems thinking because quite often uh, we just think local in the parochial. We need to start thinking system wide. How can the system be? So when I talk about TV, I also have in mind the fact that we should look at, that, at the entire ecosystem of skills development. It's very important. We cannot take one piece and assume that the engine will run that smoothly. We need to get all together. Creating, um, yeah, okay. Uh, digital technologies have disrupted industries and placed burden on TVET to adapt. TVET is not adapting. Digital skills is now all over the place. But when you go to most of the technical schools, the digital infrastructure is not there. It's lacking. Teachers don't have what it takes to instruct students in uh, digital technologies. Training institutions should therefore stop being the reactive and the plain catch up rather than adopt a future ready approach to TV. I think this is also important. We look at what is happening outside, uh, which happened years ago in Europe, what they find we are trying to catch up and uh, we are being reactive. That should not be the way for TV to go. We should start thinking about the future. And it's extremely important that uh, we adopt a future ready approach to TV. Since the future of work is digital, future ready TV implies digitalization of the curriculum and adoption of digital learning tools, such as online platforms, digital diagnostic devices, and the multimedia resources to support personalized learning, where learning is customized or tailored to diverse learning styles, learner abilities and interests. This may sound futuristic, and it is. Modern TVET should shift from a rigid curricula that stifles learners' interest to a personalized or hybrid approach that fosters curiosity, imagination, creativity, and innovation. I know that um, this is not for tomorrow, but we need to start thinking as a country how to ensure that we get learners interested in uh, learning things that interest them. If um, a learning, for example, auto uh, mechanics in a technical school, I can decide that I want to just learn how to draw design boards, auto mobile bodies. You know, I don't have to be involved in dismantling engines and so on. So, but this attitude is not there. Once you're in the auto mechanics class, then you must learn everything from A to B or so on, even if your interest is not there. So. My proposal really is that we need to be looking at a personalized sort of thing. It will take time, but we need to start thinking now. Otherwise, we will still be left behind and will continue to play catch up uh, with others. As we look into the future of TV, uh, revitalization should be more than expansion of physical infrastructure. That's why I said $1 billion of US dollars to build all classrooms import the human children and so on. It's not enough. There is much more to it than just the physical infrastructure. What are the teachers who are adequately prepared digitally to be able to pass on their skills to their young learners? Taking TVET into the fourth industrial revolution and beyond will require investment in digital infrastructure and affordable internet in TVET schools. Quality assurance is also very important. Teacher capacity building and readiness for the new paradigm and a strong industry engagement. You know, industry is struggling, but it's not going to be for everything. I don't think so. I think there's going to be time when industry will wake up again, but we need to start involving them uh, gradually into the provision of uh, quality training uh, in our technical schools. 
Teacher capacity building may involve workshops and participation in training programs, knowledge exchange, and experience sharing in the community of practice. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, the key challenges of uh, the TV system in Ghana include raising the quality, relevance, and employability of TV graduates. Strengthening the academic and professional progression pathways for students who have chosen the technical and vocational education track, and the development of multi partnership training and financing mechanisms with the private sector. Above all, policy engineering, systems thinking, and the strategy formulation for a future ready to give it, must start now. The primary goal of technical and vocational education and training is the acquisition of skills to support industrialization and economic growth, enhance the employment prospects of young people, and promote community well being and social inclusion. The TV system must also promote creativity and innovation of its graduates. However, for these desired outcomes to be achieved, government will have to create a conducive policy and a fiscal environment that encourages the establishment, growth, and expansion of enterprises, especially local industries and manufacturing firms. For it is when enterprises grow and expand that opportunities for demand-driven skills training at all levels increase. The employment prospects for TVET graduates also increase, and the social demand for TVET improves. If industry is not growing, if industry is suffering, then of course there will be no need for industry to innovate. And when innovation is lacking, then they will not be interested in hiring people who have skills that can promote innovation and increase productivity. So it's really uh, a policy decision that perhaps the Ghana Institution of Engineering can also uh, support uh, so that we can get government to begin to understand that it is not enough to train people when, in fact, you don't know where they'll be going. So this emphasis on inputs will have to change. We need to see how all the investment in inputs will translate into profits for the community. It is only then that TV education will be seen for what it is. I've always been saying that for political independence, we needed lawyers, politicians, chiefs perhaps. But for economic independence, we need those who can drive the engine of growth. And TVEC is a major contributor to this uh, whole saga of trying to move uh, the engine of growth in Ghana. I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Ali. As I said, this is going to be a conversation. I don't know, Chairman, if you want to say anything, because, it's, uh, because I'm interested in uh, having your views on some of the issues I've raised so that we can. Uh, okay. Thank you very much for such an insightful discussion that you have begun for us. And uh, please let's give one of the Before we go into question, I want to introduce our engineer past president, Alex Ayo, who has joined us. And uh, we'll be taking uh, some questions and uh, definitely we would want to look at uh, any questions for those who made time to be with us this evening. So if there's any, Question from the floor, 
we would like to uh, offer that. So we'll give the opportunity to the engineer Alex Hyatt, you know, to begin the testimony for us. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you for my classmates. <laughs> the presentation. <laughs> yeah, uh, there are some important things that goes with TVET. And I think we must have an overall objective of where we want to be. And to be taken now seriously in the world, you need to be a player in the global market because otherwise you'll be left behind. And we've come this far, we're in a hurry. We cannot be left behind. And that means that if you have to be a player in the global market, you need to be a part of the global value chain. Then there is no zero tolerance for mediocrity because if you have to be taken seriously, you have to have a workforce which can deliver. Currently, we're talking about the Africa continental free trade because look, our market in Ghana is too small for any industry to, to be able to make it because otherwise your production costs will be too high because you know there's a relationship between the market and then the cost of operating. So we have to be a player and look out. And if you have to be a player, look out. What is your industry like? What sort of personnel do you need? That's where we need to be able to train people, have a fair assessment. It needs assessment and know how, what your labor force is going to be like, and the caliber of people, the numbers that you have to churn out every year is important. Now, who's going to turn out these people? These are, uh, you need quality teachers. So you turn your investment there. You do not work backwards, but you work forward. You need to be able to invest in the teachers that will pass on the knowledge to the people. Whip up the interest and tell yourself that, listen, there's no room for mediocrity. And in that case, our workers have to change their attitude. Currently, we're standardizing on the African scene, West Africa, we're standardizing uh, specifications along the West Africa. This is going to go into Africa. We're working currently on Africa to be able to do that as well. That in itself brings production costs down because the standards between the West Africa, um, the Anglophone and Francophone is quite different. There was an electrical project along West Africa and if you look at the cost of the project, because the standards in Nigeria were quite different from that in Niger, were quite different from what in Burkina, et cetera. But you need a workforce which, when you put the specification down, they should be able to interpret things, tell two millimeters from one inch, and then they will be able to work. And when you call on people, will be able to meet the global map. So I think TVET, uh, as my classmate has said, it's, it's a very important thing. And as our senior said, Ghana is going. Africa is going nowhere without engineering. And uh, we need to take this thing very seriously. Otherwise, uh, we ain't getting anywhere. If you took the automobile industry, it's getting, it's getting electronic. I have a book there about disruptive technologies now. We have to think that direction. We have to equip our people's interests in what you call the space technology, because whatever happens there is translated to Automobile, it goes to motorcycle, it goes to other things that we use. Put up interest in that direction, and then you see you have a different sort of labor force who will be able to compete. Thank you very much. Okay. Maybe just before we go to the next question, I was uh, just when you started talking about the global trends and Africa trade area, the thought that came to mind was of course, when you gave the statistics, you mentioned about 66% of young people going, going into T-Vetting. Austria, those high numbers in Europe and the like. So you see the potential in those areas. And in Ghana, of course, when uh, the nursing thing started and a uh, lot of people were getting to nursing because of opportunities that they found out. And recently, I heard of Germany being going to have opportunity for more Tibet people. Do you think that it will be an advantage to create opportunity for people to show interest in Tibet? If we begin to espouse the advantages that they can find beyond the source of Ghana. 
so that if you know that you can be in UK or Germany, being a plumber there, you can make a lot of money. Maybe people will be interested in doing the course, just like the nurses that they did, so that they can we, we can get more people into achievement and export them. I mean, I don't think it will bring me. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. After we come to a few questions. So maybe I don't know if you want to take a few questions before you answer. Okay. So Doc, Doc, no Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, Doc, thank you very much for this wonderful submission. At least when I was going those days, I know we had quite a number of industries. Okay? We had quite a number of technical institutions. And we had friends, brothers who attended those institutions. And they were able to do quite a lot of skilled work. Then all of a sudden, things started dwindling in the country. How did we get here? You, in your submission, you talk about artisans coming from Togo, Benin to do work for us. Even though you gave us a history about the Tibet education, how it all started and how it just declined. In your experience, in your professional work, I know the opportunities are there, but the rhetoric that we have for policy makers, I wish you as a country really want to achieve certain goal and targets. And if you want to do that, what strategies are we in place to do that? Yes, Ghana Institution of Engineering is going to play or play an advocacy role. But the lighter picture comes from policymakers. So if you can share those experiences with friends that you have, what is hindering us as Ghanaians? You know, we always want to catch up. You mentioned it in your submission. Why can't we just make progress? Why can't we even know that this skill force is needed for economic growth? Why can't we just champion those things? and get our economy growing. The industries are even not there again. They are even more or less non-existent. Even though my colleague Arthur is talking about really developing new skills and uh, export them, I think there's more to do inside the country than even sending our skill for outside the country. So you can share your experiences and whether really we are ready for these challenges and opportunities that confront uh, team and education. Thank you. We'll take, I think I used the opportunity to introduce our vice president of the engineer Sophia. Jack, please, please write vice president. And then after you will, you, will, you, will, you will continue with your question because I know you had a question. Yes, before I ask my question, I just want to be sure the discussions that we have here, we are having here now. Are we collating ideas to send to those who are in charge of TVET education, or this is just for uh, so that we know how to ask the questions and how to go about it? We'll carry for you, we will send that information. For okay. Okay, thank you. Then I will ask my question. So um, I listened to Doc, and you rightly said that even the TVET institutions do not have the equipment to deliver that skills training. And so we are training people who are supposedly who are supposedly coming out with skills, but they do not have skills. We are like theorists, right? And then they come into an industry where there are no jobs to even employ them. And I'm just thinking, then why should we focus our attention on the informal sector where we can you know, develop the capacity of the master craftsmen, the welders, those you know, artisans, for them to continue, continuously improve on whatever it is that they are delivering? Because once somebody has gone to the university or to a technical institution to go and do TVET training, he comes out. The person does not feel like I have to, you know, go down there to go and work. They are looking for um, employment opportunities, which is not there. 
So we are creating a problem for ourselves instead of um, providing solutions. So one, either we are concentrating on the informal sector or as part of the TVET education, we should also include entrepreneurship. So that when they come out, they can start something on their own because there's so much money to be made in the vocational training. I mean, those of us ladies who like to sew, even somebody making your dress for you now is a lot of money. The mechanics, they are making a lot of money. Take your car to a shop, and the amount of money they charge is a lot of money. But they don't see that some of them may be even earning better salaries than those of us in the formal employment, but they don't really appreciate that. So maybe training in entrepreneurship marketing will help so we can add that as our input. Thank you. Thank you very much. So Doc, if we can take yeah. Thank you. Um, let me, I'm not going to answer it in any order, but I hope to be coherent. Um, first of all, those of us who are much older, like the Tausa child, we know that uh, <laughs> uh, when we were younger, Vaco, when we go to Vaco, most of the technicians, you know, from technical schools, I know quite a lot of, even my own uh, uh, cousins were working there. If you go to Guy, who are tall or Guy at that time, they were all, and they were all working harmoniously with uh, uh, engineers, and it was great. But cost quality was great. Now, when you talked about uh, import exporting our Tibet people, Germany will not take people that uh, we are producing now because they lack what is required. The quality is simply not there. So my thinking really is that. It's not a question of brain drain. If we have really well-qualified people, then we can have uh, uh, remittances to, to compensate for the loss of skills. But we don't have that critical mass ourselves. We don't have the quality that is required. So at this stage, my opinion is that don't let us encourage the exports of the few good ones that we have. Because if you send bad people also outside and they perform poorly, then the whole system here will have a bad reputation in future. And also, Ghanaian artists and skilled people are not good. So that can also be a pushback on us. Now, when we talk about how do we change the narrative, that's why the VP has said, one, how do we tell young people that if you are able to have quality skills and you set up your own business, this is how much you earn. That information is lacking in the public domain. Most people don't know, parents don't know. Uh, and uh, because uh, 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 our uh, system is such that we don't really let people know how much we earn. Everybody wants to be poor, actually, in Ghana. Nobody wants to be rich, but some of these mechanics are pretty rich, eh? really rich people, and they have their own workshops and garages. And that is where, for example, we can also improve upon the acquisition of practical skills of our teachers. Teachers don't necessarily have to go to big companies to learn business skills. So teachers can be trained in some of these uh, well equipped uh, uh, private. Uh, uh, workshops, if conditions are right. But the most important thing, in my opinion, is that we must look at how to develop our local industries. We need to be able to uh, give uh, uh, a favorable uh, climate for people who want to establish uh, their, their businesses to do so. Now, if you talk about entrepreneurship, people are doing lots of things. I know people who have passed out of uh, some of the polytechnics. Uh, they did uh, catering, that's uh, And now they are selling, making food at home, selling it online. And that is where digital skills also comes in. 
we need to start teaching young people some of these things so that you can uh, have your meals uh, advertised. People will call you, you you cook for them, and you 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 send these things to them. So entrepreneurship is coming up. It's taught theoretically in schools, but practically, I think the economic situation in the country is forcing people to become more innovative in terms of being entrepreneurs. But then we, they need support in order to really improve upon these things. I agree with VP that we should not just make this um, as a, a talk shop, but to try to formulate some uh, recommendations. As uh, engineer Leslie has said, I think that if you want to take advantage of uh, the African continental free trade area, then our industries must be competitive. And they cannot be competitive if you don't drive the right caliber of workers, skilled people. In fact, the Ghana Statistical Service, the latest uh, report I read about the workforce uh, distribution in Ghana, only a few, uh, the percentages that really have acquired other higher education or technical education very low. Most of the others are semi skilled people who were employed at the senior high school and so on, and then put on the job to be able to be uh, uh, line uh, uh, workers, you know, production lines and so on. But we can do much better than that. And uh, sometimes I think it's difficult to always blame government, say, must give the right environment. But, that should uh, not be uh, our approach. I think our approach is that how can we get people to know that uh, uh, skills is important? And uh, that is what our job as uh, an institution. I think we need to perhaps become more proactive, let people know that uh, this is how we can progress. And uh, Engineer Leslie said it if uh, government people can understand that without having um, a production capacity, quality products, then we are doomed. And I think I think uh, um, last thing that perhaps came up is about um, I think I talked about the informal sector. The informal sector, VP, the informal sector is uh, is uh, is doing well, but we need to do a lot more. It's not standardized. You see, that's a problem. Uh, that's what is really the problem with the informal sector. Um, if I align my, my trade as a mechanic shop at Abu um, uh, and somebody else does so at a shop in the just in Kaswa, the, the skills, competences may differ because there is no standard uh, to which uh, these people are trained. So one way for us, perhaps as engineers, may be to support how to standardize uh, some of these things, even the informal sector. This is, uh, is happening at the higher level in the West African sub-region. We have to find a way of uh, supporting the Commission for TV because that's their job, to see how we can standardize uh, skills delivery so that uh, we can get, uh, uh, if, if I'm a Brickley or a Mason trained uh, uh, here in Accra, I should have the same competencies as somebody trained uh, in Kofridia. And that is something that we have to be uh, looking at. Thank you very much. We have a few questions online, so we will want to take those questions. Hello. Doc, please, you can't talk. Oh, OK. Uh... Yeah, uh, I'm talking from my perspective as a, a chairman of the engineering council, and also I happen to be the chairman of one of the technical universities. And I really wish I could have been, you know, uh, there in person and you know to meet uh, Dr. Fetty. Uh first, and you made the point that, uh, frankly. We have to make a conscious effort to shift our economy away from buy and sell. If you don't produce, then the need for the T-bed products 
goes down very significantly. And in fact, there are actually two types of uh, TVET products, the, the production TVET and then the services TVET. And what we observe is that the services TVET, you know, like the mechanics and so on, you know, they provide reasonable service. We have some of them, you know, but the multiplier effect for the services TVET is low. It is the production TVET that has a great multiplier effect, employing more people and so on and so forth. And that really cannot take off if you don't shift the economy from buy and sell. So I think the first thing, whatever we do, we need to push to make this economy one of production and not just you know, one of uh, uh, importation. And uh, the opportunities for the African continental free trade, if you don't produce, what are you going to trade? So the key is to have production, you know, and I think somebody observed that many of our factories, you know, have uh, closed down. We need to bring them up. That's the first thing. There may be challenges and they need to be protected, you know, so that at least they can grow over a period of time and uh, take, you know, uh, uh, so, so that's the first thing. And the services TVED, we need to equip them with uh, what I call sort of business skills. Many of our artisans, technicians, uh, they don't keep good books. You know, they, when you talk of return on investment and stuff like that, those things don't mean anything to them. I've dealt with quite a few of them and we need to equip them with those skills so that they become a lot more efficient. The other part is uh, what I call a role model. Because the young ones, they are looking around at uh, the future, you know. So it is the uh, economic, they can make money and so on and so forth. And the other is they look at who is doing what. And this is where, uh, you know, at technical universities have had a challenge. And I know, Dr. Fiti, you were one of the brains behind uh, the uh, development of the technical universities. It looks like somewhere along the line, we lost our way. And many of these technical universities, you know, seem on, bent on becoming mini uh, K, KNUSDs, mini, you know, uh, Legons. When you look at promotion criteria and so on and so forth, really, they are completely decoupled from where we should be going with the TVET for national development. So here it is a GTEC. And you know, some of us have been struggling because it's very difficult to get your staff to focus on being hands-on when their promotion criteria is very similar to you know the uh, uh, you know uh, the Legon, the you know KNUSTs and so on very little emphasis on things like innovation, on things like invention. Those should be the uh, guiding criteria for promotion at the technical universities. But no, you know, so, so that's another part of the struggle. So in my mind, there are two drivers, the economic driver and then the role model driver. And we need to push both of these so that uh, we can, you know, uh, gain footing. Otherwise, we'll be talking and talking and talking, and we'll come back in 20 years, and we'll still be talking about the same issues. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Mohamed Thank you very much. Before we continue, please, this is the a program that is a collaboration between the electrical technical division and the mechanical agri marine technical division of the institution. Um, those online, please uh, keep your questions coming. And then if there are any questions in here too, we will take them. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
engineer David Saki. Engineer David Saki, go ahead, please. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Ch Chairperson. And then excellent presentation from Doc. So um, I'm not very old, but I happen to practice a bit in the construction sector in Ghana. I taught a little while in Hotelinka University, and I'm currently doing my PhD in Germany. Now, when you pick an artisan from Ghana, let's say a painter or a tiler, compared to somebody from, let's say, Germany, the workmanship is so, so excellent. The painter will paint in Germany and you won't even have a drop on the ground. The same to all the other skills. Now, from your experience, you alluded to the fact that even now we have to pick these guys even from Togo. What is the one thing that the Togolese are doing right in your experience that we are not getting right in, in our, our, edu our, our technical education, our TV education here, not to even compare them to even Germany because the standard is just too high for them that they will not be able to meet. What is the one thing that we are just lacking? Thank you very much. Michael. Michael. Sure. Michael. Okay, good evening. <laughs> Engineers. Um, uh, Dr. Engineer Afeti, thanks so much for your presentation. But uh, I have a little problem. Uh, my problem stems from data I have gathered from um, uh, Ghana Skills Development Fund, they had a program and I attended. About a quarter of a million graduates uh, are trained every year, and only 2% get um, employed in the former sector. Now, if we are looking at training uh, TVET practitioners, the question here is, how, what happens in the near future? That's the first question. We end up shifting from training um, a holistic work workforce to having a lot of TVET practitioners and will not balance with our lawyers, accountants, and so forth. So I want engineers to contribute to helping the country to plan holistically. And then looking at how many engineers, technicians, and so on can support the country. You can have a country where uh, we have more people in the humanities than the technicians and engineers. And we've, if we shift our focus to training Tibet, then very soon the, the, the balance will tilt towards engineers and then we'll lose in the other field. So that's the first thing I want um, Ghana Institution of Engineers and then engineering practitioners to help the country to do. The other um, contribution I want to make is, or a question is, what is uh, the country or policy makers expecting from the Ghana Institution of Engineering and then engineering practitioners. So for instance, I'm sitting in my office right now and I've attended, attended a Ghana Skills Development Fund program. I'm participating in um, electronic, electrical division of Ghana Institute of Engineers. The next thing is what is expected of me? Where do I go from here? Do I write a paper? How do I mentor somebody? Is that GHIE going to set up a desk where we'll get uh, a mechanic at NEMA who needs to be mentored? Or, or, or where do we go from here? That's my um, other question. Thank you so much. Thank you. Do you want to respond to? Very briefly, just two, 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 two uh, quick uh, remarks. The first one is what uh, the general doctor, uh, what he mentioned about the technical universities uh, that happen to be uh, drifting, you know, because they seem to be mimicking the uh, traditional university. 
that was not the philosophy behind the uh, conversion of the polytechnics to technical universities. I can tell you a short history, which is off record, because I remember, you know, I chaired the committee that run, that uh, developed the roadmap, and I remember very well that uh, when we were discussing the bill, Palip, one of the MPs called me and said, the polytechnics at the time, who were just about to be upgraded, they are rectors, were in parliament, and uh, they wanted to be called vice chancellors. When in fact, the report that we wrote recommended that they should maintain the same rector or even president. But then some MPs were saying that uh, in Ghana, the head of a university is a vice chancellor. <laughs> So, so you see some confusion, lack of understanding of the purpose of the technical universities, because the idea is that you need to be differentiated. It's an element of differentiation. If uh, we don't differentiate the technical universities from the traditional universities, then they will want to become like them, uh, what we call in education, isomorphism. They just want to be like them, and they become a small copy of the, of the big one. And that is a real problem for us now because we we bungle things when we were trying to implement. This is not the way that it should have been. Shouldn't be vice chancellor. You don't have to be vice chancellor to be able to do great things. You know, there are some polytechnics in Malaysia, in even in Germany, US, where they don't call them VCs, but they're doing wonderful things. So I think uh, the problem was that even at the level of parliament, our lawmakers did not understand uh, what is exactly the technical universities were, uh, were supposed to do, but it's not too late. It's not too late because I see now that some of the technical universities are trying to encourage um, lower level skills development uh, programs as well. But the problem is that what I'm coming to now is that the teachers don't have the practical skills. That, that is the bottom line. Don't have the practical skills. So we cannot get the quality that we want. So they depend mostly on uh, on the theory. In Kenya, for example, there was a survey and uh, a number of uh, almost 75% uh, of the teachers said uh, uh, they don't teach practicals because they don't have the skills. And that is one of the things that perhaps we need to start thinking seriously about how to ensure that teachers have uh, workplace uh, experience and the skills to impact. And they can do this by collaborating with uh, the informal sector uh, uh, people because there can be a cross fertilization of ideas. Teachers from the institutions will bring their theory things to the workshop, and then the practical things they will also acquire. How do we create that synergy, you know, so that uh, we have uh, our informal sector workers who have good skills practically to also learn a few theories so that they don't paint and then uh, the whole place becomes. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So so uh, let me let me conclude this short aspect of it. Uh, this part of the discussion by saying that the people in Germany or even the people in Togo who are trained, they are trained by, most of them are trained by informal sector uh, master trainers. And they know that they, they, that is their job. And uh, they, they strictly adhere to some quality standards. So I'm beginning to agree with the VP that we need to get more support for the informal sector. But the truth of the matter is that the informal sector is slow to absorb new technologies. Uh, so we will have a situation where the informal sector may be good practically, but if they they look at new things like electronic uh, cars now, some of them, the old ones, they can't deal with electronic uh, ignition systems now because the, the technology really uh, has uh, more or less overtaken them. That is why synergy and collaboration between the formal sector and uh, the informal uh, sector. I think we'll take a few Thank you very much. Right.
Inside, okay. I saw your hand up. Oh, are you okay? I'd like to contribute to the collaboration bit. So there had some work that has actually begun in the informal sector. So and um, since we are carrying this discussion forward, um, I'll mention to the institution, um, DTI, Design Technology Institute, I was part of a conference the name um, Precision Quality Conference. And this is the fourth one. And what they are doing is a bottom-up approach, and they have funding from MasterCard Foundation. They have brought the market queens on board. Um, engineer Dr. Kwame Bachi mentioned online that um, the two sectors he was mentioning is the production TV. So DTI is doing the production. So welders and uh, all the people we call it informal. At that conference, they said they, they refuse to be called informal because that's how we, we still call it informal because we are looking at people in shirts and tie and suits, but they are, they are formal. Um, so yes, but informal, they, they have started collaborating. They are looking at their position, their position so that if it is a, a shirt, they, they have dressmakers. If it is a size 14 shirt, it is the same in um, so I'm, it is the same in Makola, sort of. So DTI is doing some work with that. Now with the services TVET, where we are providing services, the um, private sector has also started some work. I like the role model bit mentioned. So I can mention um, Engineer Mauduche, who has served as a role model in um, private sector. BP mentioned um, entrepreneurship. So this company has done solar installations, mastered um, great connected systems. I was part of the team. Exported technicians from Ghana to work on the solar grid system in Bermuda. So there are seven team members from Ghana who have received mentorship from a role model that they look up to. But um, like you said, they are not going and not coming back. But they get the exposure of working on another system. And what um, made me proud about the services that we offered outside of Ghana, outside of Africa, is that we were able to quickly move from, you know, in Ghana, we train for British. In Bermuda, they use American standards. But the level of understanding that the technical team from Ghana had to be able to translate and be able to discuss technical issues, even in chief. Like understand what we were doing and executing that um, offshore was the uh, example. So all this was there. Every things have to be in the field. Any any comments from inside from online? I think what I would like to say has already been commented on earlier. But um, I was part of the team that was involved in supplying. Uh, new equipment to the uh, vocational institutes uh, from last year. So, but the point I raised earlier with Doctor is that uh, okay, it has been established that industries are down, factories are down. So when they come out of school, what I one joke I always used to tell my students is that what we teach you in class is for you to pass exams. If you want to practice re-engineering, when you come out, follow the people on the job. That is where you really learn with your hands. So that's the joke I always use. So we are going to turn out these young people with all the knowledge, uh, vocational knowledge, but they need to practice, have the opportunity to practice on the field in order to up the game. Meanwhile, we don't have plenty of functional factories here, everything we are importing. This is the challenge. So instead of a government policy being focused more on the, the training of the, the, the youngsters with the skills in the vocational institute, what preparations are we making to make sure that they get the opportunity to practice and acquire, sharpen the skills on the field? That, is, that for me is a challenge. So that is what is now leading to this export of uh, people outside. That because we haven't focused on locally doing, for example, <laughs> let me look at the agri sector. If I'm a rice 
for specialized growing rice. The opportunity is there to do that. But we keep on importing foreign rice in volumes. So what is the what is the what is the attraction for anybody to go into that sector? So that is it's good that we have expanded the vocational training, training institutions, equipments, and all that. But we also need to look at the end product because if a, if a, if a politician says uh, entrepreneurial skills, we are going to uh, uh, set up uh, support for entrepreneurs. And you are talking about 10,000, I don't know the figure anyway, I'm only guessing. Talking about 10,000. What can you do? Cannot do anything. Let's say a welder, somebody has trained himself as a welder. He wants very practice. To buy a welding, to, to get a land, to settle up a shop, uh, to buy a welding machines and all that is a huge amount. But if we have some kind of technology village, for example, at every location where we have this training so that from the school they can be absorbed in there and they practice, then it becomes a header for them to, to go into their own practice. So this is, this has been said earlier, but this is my contribution to the subject. Okay. Thank you. Um, my name is Dixon Deutsche, I'm from Telegraphic. So I agree with uh, what our senior over there was saying. Um, but then when he was talking, he was talking about factory that he was kind of saying it in the semi-formal level thinking factories, technology village, and all that. And it's all, but then right now we don't have, and we can't wait till we have them. So what about when our students are on vacation or maybe for the national service or whatever? We assign them to these, so we shouldn't call them informal. The, these auto shops we have in our communities, we send them there instead of thinking about the factories and then there's you maybe for your internship. We register them, we say we first we register them so that we know where they are, every nook and cranny. And then we send the students there to get their ground skills, the ones we've been talking about. I mean, I'm, this is just a suggestion. Thank you. Um, I'm Anthony Jamesi. Um, what I want to ask um, Doc is, um, I went to, or I received my technical education from Ghanaian German Training Center. It's a, a school in Pamplum, Kanishi, um, built by the Germans in cooperation with the, you know, Ghana. And what we went through uh, as training was that uh, you do 20% theory and 80% practice. So what it meant is that um, for a whole for the whole week, you have one day in a classroom. Virtually, we, we even say it's a, it's a lab. In that classroom, you spend it in a lab. And the trainers come and they introduce you to what you'll be doing for the next four days when you go to the workshop. So the workshop is just uh, attached to um, the classrooms. So that was how it's done. And our time it was three years. Um, you have to write the NVTI grade one. Uh, it used to be NCC, but they reduced it even to grade one. And then after that, you can do the uh, NC, which is the National Class One Certificate before you go on and on and on. And so uh, I want to ask that with the TVET or the CTVET programs, um, what is the proportion of the time allocated for practice and then theory? So that, uh, and even with the Ghanaian German Training Center school, when you do two years, at the foot of your third year, you are, you are not needed in the school. So you are sent to the industry. And I had my first industrial. Uh, uh, experiential learning at the uh, art preschool at uh, eight years, automotive and technical uh, service for a whole nine months. So for the whole nine months, every week I have only a day to come to the school and receive some training in classroom. Then I go until it was exam time. I, came, so I wanted to be from 
know. And then uh, he was also my director at the uh, Hoop and Technic thing. Director and Alliance. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so before you respond, uh, JD, uh, hello. So what you have shared had structure by it. Um, the challenge when we went to first year, I read electrical engineering. And then they sent some of our like first class students for internship at the time at Ghana um, Telecom, um, Vodafone now. And because there's always friction between technicians or from between informal sector and then the people from the university, they sent the people to go and dig for cables, like yeah. to dig. So they didn't have any hands on engineering training while they, they sort of, depending on the structure and the policy and the regulation, the person may be attached to a certain person or institution but not get the skills that we sent them there for. So what you have mentioned was structured and then maybe regulated and then inspected. Otherwise, um, the safety of the people, the people sometimes get there and are abused. And because maybe the boss you are assigned to is like, ah, so I should teach you so that you come and take over the business or you have to invest and and all that. So I like the fact that engineer um, doctor mentioned uh, conducive policy. But let's hear from Thank you. Thank you, Lucy. Um, the idea mentioned by the gentleman from uh, Graphic was actually practiced some time ago. Uh, they had what they called the National Apprenticeship Program, where master trainers were incentivized, they were paid some stipends to train uh, young people, especially junior high school graduates. The program failed miserably, miserably because without the payment, the master trainers were not willing to do the proper training that was required. So the program really did not attain the objectives for which it was started. That is where the issue of commitment, policy environment, structured sort of uh, training is important. I also know that some companies uh, are not willing to bring in students to work on their very expensive, expensive uh, tools uh, because they fear that one, they could damage the, the expensive uh, machinery, and then they will not have any compensation for that. Or two, the students might get uh, injured, and then there will be a problem. But this could be resolved in terms of taking insurance for the students and also ensuring uh, that um, that uh, uh, the, the company itself is also insured. It's all a question of uh, commitment on the part of all of us to have quality. Uh, training uh, delivery. Now, the percentages that um, are involved in uh, in uh, uh, in the in the entire spectrum of skills development are the lower levels, basic training, and so on. Now, it's thirty percent or it's seventy percent uh, practice in the technical institution. That's what the curriculum says. I want to emphasize that, but I'm not sure if that is what is done in practice. Uh, and then uh, at the technician level, uh, it's 40% uh, uh, theory, 60% uh, uh, practice. But this is only on paper. Why? One, do we have the teachers who themselves have the practical skills so that they can say, I'm going to devote one third of the time or two thirds of the time to practice? That is a problem. The other thing is the uh, question of consumer where you need to perhaps in the case of say missionary or carpentry or whatever, if you are learning, you destroy things, you know, you learn, but, and then you have to bring in more materials for teaching and learning and the funding is poor, so it's a problem. And then finally, your example, you are lucky to have studied earlier when you have R.T. school and all that. Now, <laughs> now we don't have similar uh, institutions functioning properly and at full blast 
in order to support uh, uh, training. But these ideas are things that perhaps the institution can begin to uh, think through and see how we can push it forward. Because there's a great need for this country to have a quality trained, skilled workforce for which uh, 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 the country can, without a skilled workforce, we cannot transform our natural resources. We cannot do anything. Uh, so I think it's important that we uh, look at the training of the trainer as well. That is also a key area where we have to put our emphasis on. If you don't have qualified instructors, then uh, we'll have a problem. But I also like the idea of collaboration with uh, the informal uh, sector uh, players. It's also very important. MC. Let me make uh, just a little comment on uh, what I heard about uh, for the phone, the guys when they were supposed to dig trenches, etc. Uh, let me use my my experience. Now, when we at that time at KNUST, um, after the uh, during the summer break, we were tied to company. And I I did civil engineering, so we worked at uh, CD House when uh, it was coming up. And I was attached to steel vendors, and I had to be with the steel vendors. I thought, hey, I did the YDX and did some integration, and then you put me in a filter of air condition off, and you're asking me to try. And I thought that was, and I'll go lay how the rebars had to be, etc. I thought this was uh, below me, but I, I sat down to a nice pool, worked with them. They had to dig, you had to be with them and dig. Now, you fast forward, and I was working on a project, and I thought that when I was attached uh, for the European firm on a, a major road project, and then my senior asked, go to the quarry, go and be with the technicians on the quarry. And I was wondering, as a stand engineer, if you are asking me to go to the quarry, be inside there working with other people. I thought the man was a racist, blah, blah, blah. I don't like it. Then I went in Germany and a similar thing happened. And I thought, I also called them racist because they were asking to do things. Fast forward, what happened to me is I understood and understand where steel vendors come from. When I make, I have a design and I come to supervise you and you are tying wrongly. I can tell you that what you're doing is wrong because most of the technicians assume that the engineers don't know. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. The thing that you don't know, that you're able to give instructions, practical instructions to the people. My surveyors, I called them on a Saturday, they refused to work and they thought this engineer could, I put up the children the light and everything I worked, then you I could do their work. So any instruction that you 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 had to give them, they knew this man knows what he's talking about, and you follow your instruction. It's the same in the in the workshop floor. If the man knows that you know how to apply, it and when he gives instructions, you do, and it helps you, the engineer, do many things. I have a more radical approach towards when we say uh, we don't have any work. Except. Why in the college, the universities, and this is done outside the country, the first years. Send them to the to Kusia uh, somewhere there. Look at how the people are living. What can you do to improve the life of the people? Then engineering, they begin to think application of fluid mechanics, application, how can I make the water flow? How can I do this? It makes you think and be more innovative. It, when you bring them up that way, when they sit in the workshop, and also in the offices, they're able to think about how to improve all things. Listen, in France, six-year-olds, five-year-olds on TV, they give them a project. Believe me, they give them a project. I was watching, I said, ah. They tell the little kids, plan a city. At five, plan a city. And you see these little kids, 
this thing must come here, you know, to get up, they are going to be weak, they'll come back, but they do something. They come up learning how to do something. They're given the jigsaw puzzle, they work with it, they're able to put things together. When it comes to the workshop and you're asking them to do things, they understand how systems work and you're able to come up with innovative ideas. And it makes your teaching relevant to them because you're adding, uh, you're adding some finesse to what they're doing. And I believe that that thing from the bottom, and when it comes to TV, and we give them work to do, they'll be able to apply and be relevant in the global field. That's what we're looking at. Thank you. Yeah, I made, I made this emphasis uh, earlier about uh, if we don't quench our appetite for importation, it's going, that will, it will not get us anywhere. Because I remember when we came out the university, there were factories all over the place. GTMC was there. Uh, in fact, of course, on the standing on his feet, um, plenty of them, right? And throughout the four years we were at school, we had the opportunity for vacation attachment. This time, I don't even know whether they are able to, to do it. How many factories are functional? So you come out, come out, you are raw. That time, we were able to have the attachment. And then when we came out, like I said earlier, which I mean it, that engineering, we learn it in the field. What you learn at school is to pass your exams. You come out, because if, if, you, if, you, if you brought the, 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 the lecturer who is teaching thermodynamics to a plant room and showed him a boiler, you look at it, you're confused. You're confused, you see? So it is when you come out. So along the same line, this, this chapter, they come, they, well, you mentioned the point that the skills that the trainers must also have the skills because I know some of my, I won't, I won't even mention, they were, <laughs> they are teaching at the polytechnic and they haven't done, they haven't, I won't mention the field, they haven't done any practice in the field with this, with, with, the, with this subject, right? I have been working, I work with the, the subject for so many years, right? So it is very important that the trainers also have the expertise to build a training, but when they come up, the real thing is in the field. That is why if you go to our market day, you, you get disappointed. Everything is important. So everybody thinks it is quicker money to import with your capital than to try to set up a venture and then all the challenges that the frustrations that you face. So this is it. So while we are pushing, pushing up the pressure to equip the vocational institutions, we must also be looking at the end, what happens to them. Because somebody may have the intention that, oh, I'm going to set up the workshop even to make canopies for funerals and things like that. If he gets a capital, where is he going to get a capital? And we shouldn't undervalue the capital that is needed even to start the smallest business in Ghana today. So these are the challenges. So we should look at it at the state level, where, how we are going to create the environment for them to move on after they have left the educational institutions so that out of frustration, you don't get to other friends. Thank you. So, can you some comment online and take a question. Thank you very much for your contribution so far. I believe we are all learning and taking something from today's session. So, Engineer Gedal Kudaki says, um, how can DHIE escalate this awareness on the national level? It looks like some of these vital conversations are done door and, and do not go far. Our country needs serious reorientation on this. Um, yeah, thank you, sir. Okay. And then Julius Jack says there is always this war for superiority in industry between engineers and technicians. How can an engineer in industry pass on many years of experience to the technician when in the technician's mind, all the engineer knows is book? Okay. 
And then um, there was a response to Julius that passing on years of experience from engineers to technicians can be challenging, especially when there's a perceived rivalry or superiority conflict involved. It's important to approach this situation with understanding, patience, and respect. This shouldn't just be about transferring knowledge. It's also about fostering a working environment where everyone is respected for their skills and expertise, and everyone feels comfortable learning from each other. Um, is there are uh, three hands up, we'll just take those. Um, Engineer Matthew, uh, Akati, Michael, and Paddy Black, and then Engineer Robert will round up for us. Yeah. Then Nana Kwame Ojo, that's the last one we are reading out. He says, Why don't we, as engineers and planners, make it visible the average salaries of engineers and technicians in Ghana for every year to the media? It will really entice the youth to consider tea. Oh, yeah. So, Engineer Matthew, and you go on. Thank you very much, Juliet. Um, my question or my contribution is only one for the purposes of others getting their chance to also contribute. I am looking at um, contributions from industry into Tibet institutions. I'll pick only one aspect. You go to industries and you see a lot of equipment and tools, okay, that are discarded in a way, lying at their warehouses, lying all over the compounds. Can we appeal to these institutions to just make a simple donation? Let's say VRA can donate, let's say, a small damaged oil circuit baker. Let's say a, a, a 161 kilovolt is a string insulator, one that is somehow shattered, lying at the substation. Just donate these to these technical institutions. I am speaking from experience. We expect that people should know these things. They see them in books, they read about them, they can understand the way they work, but they cannot identify them because the investments to get such equipment are quite expensive. But for the institutions, because they have them and they use them every day in the industry, when they are a little bit not functional, could we please appeal to them to just donate just samples of these equipment and items to most of these Tibet institutions. So they can be able to just identify and see them and know what they are. So that when they come out from these institutions and they're looking for jobs, we don't say that these Tibet graduates are not fit for the job industry. So this is just my humble appeal, just one of these to most of these institutions. If the GHIE can, can try and communicate this to the institutions to donate most of this equipment, armor cables, underground cables, different types, um, different types of switches, different types of relays, they are lying there, not doing anything. They are even looking for places to, 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 to dispose them. They are not getting places. Please just send them to these schools for them to see what a string insulator is. This is just my humble appeal. And to the chairman of the division, if you can take this up for me, I'll be very, very, very happy to these technical institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and to support that, engineer David Arthur says, as an engineering group, a lot of us are experienced in our respective fields. And we have volunteers from the industry to assist the lecturing of the practical part of engineering. Can GHI arrange for that? Okay. And Paddy, and then we are that's it. Okay. Engineer Paddy. Engineer Go ahead. Well, thank you very much, Madam. And good evening to all the senior engineers in the meeting. Um, mine has to do with um, um, our 
trainees that um, we are say, we are all saying that they come out of schools and they don't have practical uh, hands-on training. Um, it's a simple um, appeal that I want to make. Uh, it's a suggestion that I want us to uh, um, look at whether it is possible for us to do. For instance, um, if you go to Accra Technical University, um, is it possible for us to commercialize the departments so that, um, for instance, if you go to the automobile department, they have a workshop, a complete workshop that they take contracts from outside. So they have a complete workshop with uh, uh, the instructors manning the place so that anytime the students have a practical um, um, job, to, uh, if there are jobs to be done in the workshop, they bring the students to come and do it. And they, they grade them according to, I mean, the training that they give them so that um, in so doing, the students will have some practical training and the uh, institution will be also earning money. So maybe you go to ministries, you bid for a contract from ministries and you take their vehicles, you repair it for them, you use your students, teach them how to uh, handle tools and how to repair these things and you collect money and um, both ways you'll be, you'll be earning if it's possible for um, us to suggest to the institutions to do that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Engineer Samuel Yawlinki, uh, 30 seconds, please. Hello? Okay. Engineer Dr. Kwame Boache, please go ahead. Hello. Good evening. This is Samuel Yawlinki. Go ahead, please. Uh, please, uh, good evening to you all. My name is Samuel Lenti. And I think earlier on, a speaker spoke about how the institution has can collaborate with the uh, industries so that at the end of the day, the institution, the training that they are giving to the student is the industry that will stand to benefit. I have worked with VRA and Grico for the past 16 years. And sometimes when a student comes and then you take them to field, just simple identification of electrical device, they are finding it difficult. And I ask myself, we have a lot of devices that we are not using, circuit breakers, isolators, a, a whole lot that institutions can write to these various institutions that I've just mentioned, VRA, Netco, or Gridco. And I think when you take it up, I don't think they will hesitate. So is there is the institution ahead that have to start the move? Because at the end of the day, the training you are giving to the student is the uh, industry that benefits. So that is my humble opinion. I think the institution has the protecting the investors, they have to take it up so that they will write to the various institutions, industry players, so that they can collaborate. At the end of the day, we all benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Last comment from engineer Dr. Kwame Wache. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to pick up from the suggestion that the gentleman made that typically when these products come from school, they need, you know, practical training. And this is where, you know, the lack of industry, you know, the thing that I like to emphasize is that many of the things that we are talking about really come down to making sure that we reactivate manufacturing in the country. Without that, it's going to be very tough. In fact, in 2019, uh, uh, the MasterCard Foundation uh, funded a conference uh, which uh, the GHIE was a, a major leader. And we brought people, you know, Ghanaians from all over the world in engineering, you know, uh, with a lot of experience and so on. And we proposed to build what we are calling a technology development and manufacturing center to be like the uh, gap between industry and the classroom. And the idea was that uh, you get uh, to train 
the graduates, you know, because industry, most of our industry is not even strong enough to bring in graduates because they are struggling. When they are struggling, they really don't have, you know, the uh, flexibility to even bring in people and train them. Most of our industries are really, you know, so if you could build this technology development and manufacturing center, which would be like, you know, the bridge between industry and the uh, academia, this would help. And the idea was to get the uh, GHIE to be the sponsor of uh, this uh, TDMC. Unfortunately, in fact, we're working with uh, the uh, Minister of uh, Environment, Science and Technology. You know, many of these things require funding. And unless, you know, we have a policy which says we are serious about, you know, uh, revitalizing our industry, bringing back up our industry, we will have many of these activities which will then just simply, you know, fizzle. And I think as GHIE, we really need to bring pressure on, you know, our policy makers and so on, lobby as much as possible to get across the idea that if we don't develop you know, a system where industries are coming back up and so on and so forth, then all this talk about TVET and so on will be very limited. As I said, the services part of TVET can continue. We can train people to provide our services, you know, and I think we've mentioned a number of those, and those will continue. But the production part of TVET, which is really where you begin to see the magnif uh, magnification factor, the multiplier effect, this when you set up industries, you employ many more people and so on and so forth. But all of that requires the country saying that manufacturing is important and we need to find a way to bring back you know, manufacturing. If we're able to do that successfully, I think all these other pieces will fit in because then that becomes the demand for all the skills that we are talking about and you know, many of the things will come together at that point. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so we are just running out. My faithful ones who came with us here. I'll take one. The chest link or let me take this. Yeah. Uh, I have a problem with the society. Currently, much emphasis has been laid on training. Training, 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 it's a practical experience and all those things. But the post-training, much has not been said about that. And post-training is what the problem is. You'd be surprised that the fine guy, good guy, we train them, not all of them are, are I mean, are bad or don't have experience. Some of them are, they have good quality experience. They come out there, they try to sell their, their knowledge, but they don't have people to buy their knowledge. I've notified some guys after their training, then they want to go outside. I want to go to Canada. I want to go to Germany. I want to go to do my master, do my best. But whilst in-house in, in Ghana here, they can practice and also make a living. And also, I mean, make money. But then our system is, is not trying to appreciate them or trying to assimilate them. Guys come out from school, well trained, say, for instance, the training or automation. They come to you, please, I have this knowledge. Do you need my services to fix some automations in your house or like a water tank and so on, like motion sensors and, 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 and so on. But society don't, 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 don't look at that, don't appreciate that. It's also part of the problems that we have, uh, uh, have in Ghana here. Said so guys, when they finish from school, they want to go out, go, they can't practice. Like my senior man said, even to set up a, a company in Ghana here, a workshop in Ghana here, is also another edit. You see, that's the problem. I knew guys who were able to, I mean, put this electronics part together and form something and even make this amplified and life. But all their attempts were killed 
because society were not appreciating them. So this is one of the aspects that we have to look at. That after training them, let's try to uh, absorb them in the society, attach them with some people, even though they can also share ideas with them, so that they can also come up and bring them up. Not only training, training, training. Yes, emphasis is made on training. That's correct. But post training, this is a part of the cycle. Because it's a Ghana, a human people, so everybody wants to go out. That is not right. Thank you. Thank you. Doc would give his final comments. And uh, maybe just to pick on one thing that was said. I happen to be engaged also with one of the corporate uh, equipment installation projects, the Chinese funded one. Uh, and we did it in about 16 institutions, Komboni and uh, Bogatanga and all that. And one thing that the Chinese said was that anywhere that they do such a project in their country, there is a connection between the project and the community that I think one person was talking about how we can use some of these facilities to generate funds and be commercial. Some of the projects we did, even the, the, the principals of the schools did not even know that a project like that was in their school. And they just went to install for them. So like the concept of even relating the institution, what, what they are installing to the community was not there. And how we can even as an institution help to utilize this equipment, because I very good equipment that they put in all these workshops. And I could see that they are going to go waste if we don't have a strategy actually to use them and to make them in a way able to generate funds, even to help the school and to help those, uh, I mean, in the committee as well. So that's something that you can take. Uh, as the final uh, remarks that you make. So, and then when you are done with that, that means the chairman uh, of mechanical who then come. All right. Okay. On the last one, you said uh, in the course of our going around, we kept emphasizing to the vocational institutions that if you are going to rely on government for your consumables, everything will fail because the government doesn't have the capacity to do that. Wedding rolls, you never get it. So commercialize your activity. And I can mention one uh, institution, Kumasi Vocational Training Institute. They do virtually everything with all their departments. The Ethiopian people are experts. They take food orders to all over the place, even funerals. The workshop, you no, know, the plumbing, they are doing gates, commercial. The uh, spraying, commercial. Uh, for the car at the wedding and this thing. So it's possible to for them to understand that the commercial aspect of what they do will help the students because they will they will know what is good, what is going to be expected of them when they go out to the real world. But it also helps them to stand on their feet because the consumables, there's no money, there's no money there. I remember when I was once head of department at KNU USD Mechanical. A student came to my office and they said, you were welding and then the gas is finished, but you said there's no money to buy gas. <laughs> <laughs> and that is the reality. That is the, the real situation. So uh, it's not so gloomy for the, them if they commercialize their activities. It, it has two side effects. The students would learn what, they would learn to appreciate what they will be doing when they go out in the real world and they have they acquire that expertise and also it will help the institution to stand on their feet. I will just uh, make just one sentence because all that we've been saying this evening has to do with only one thing, systems thinking. It's the systems perspective that I want to bring out that it's not just in school, society is there, economic policies, industry involvement, collaboration with engineers. So it's a systems thinking approach that I think should be our takeaway from here. It's just not one out of a lot. It's just you have to look at the whole system and the interdependencies and relationships and so on. I think that is the only way we can make progress. Systems perspective, systems thinking. Thank you. Thank you.
So fellow colleague, engineering practitioners so far, so good. Two hours has just passed. Yes, it's at around 5.30 and it's past uh, 7.30. So, and uh, all of you, all of us, those in present and online, I think you can all be okay that uh, Dr. Fethi has done a very good presentation to share a lot of insightful uh, experience on the TVETs. And our topic for today is TVETs, challenges and opportunities. And he's done a wonderful job. So he deserves a round of applause. He's talk about the takeaway for this evening, which is system thinking. System thinking, and I think is one of the takeaways we also have to carry to our colleagues. And uh, I wanted to just just reiterate his quote. I wrote somewhere. Yes, natural resources do not have natural owners, but those who exploit the resources. He's been a very wonderful resource person for us this year. And uh, Doc, who uh, oh, just knock for your doors once again. Uh, for you to share some other topic, not even uh, something you think uh, I don't the day will benefit the engineering practitioners, Ghana as a country and Africa as a whole. We thank you very much. And for those of us who have sat in through this time, two good hours, we think uh, you really enjoyed and you'll be patient, your questions, your comments have all been taken on board. And uh, thank you. And uh, I'll leave it for them to continue. Otherwise, I'm taking the shine from here, which I don't want to do. So thank you very much. Thank you, Doc. And then uh, our past president, yeah, thank you very much for sitting through. Our vice president, yeah, are you yeah, drinking some milo or something? Welcome. And those of us. Oh, let's go. Let's go. Is there. Okay. Thank you very much for participating. Thank you, Engineer Talentin, and thank you all very much. We have some water and refreshments at the back. Please don't be in a hurry to go. Let's um, interact a bit before we go. Um, thank you. Thank you to everybody. Shall we pray? Father, we thank you for being with us. Thank you for such um, an insightful and discussion that will set us all thinking and acting in our various fields and um, institutions. We thank you that you send us home safely and we pray for the Ghana Institution of Engineering and all institutions like this. We pray that in every field of endeavor in our education in um, medical sector and engineering and economics in every area of Ghana, you will help us as a nation we thank you for answered prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good evening. Thank you.